Well, good morning. Like I said, uh, thank you. Pleasure to be here with you guys today. Uh, gonna go over a little bit about, about our organization, uh, what we do, some of the things that we're doing with beef and buffalo and uh, our tribal food sovereignty efforts, some of the challenges and um, successes I think that we've had. And uh, definitely open to questions. Um, I encourage them. Uh, I don't do this for a living. I think of myself as just a rancher, so um, bear with me a little bit. Um, just a little bit about myself, I guess. Uh, I am a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. I'm a sixth generation rancher here on the Cheyenne River Reservation. Uh, I've been running a cow calf operation on my own for over 20 years. I started out with my parents, um, grew up on their ranch and kind of worked my way into my own operation. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in range management from South Dakota State University. Uh, prior to what I'm doing with the Buffalo program, I, I worked about 20 years in land management and trust services with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and another branch called the Office of the Special Trustee. And currently, I guess I'm the CEO for the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Buffalo Authority Corporation. Uh, basically, what we are is we are a tribally chartered business corporation, meaning I guess uh, we're owned 100% by the tribe, but we operate independently of them. We have our own board of directors and bylaws and, you know, similar to the way I guess any other corporation would operate. I think to really tie this all together, you, you really need to uh, look at the historical components of, of the Lakota Sioux people and how we got to where we are today and how we got into agriculture. Um, you know, we were not an agriculture society per se. We were a warrior society, a hunting, hunting society. So it makes a little sense, I think, to to kind of go through that. Um, just the buffalo beginnings, if you look at these pictures, you know, the prehistoric buffalo were huge, you know, I mean, up to eight foot tall and 4,000 pounds. They had these big old nasty longhorn looking horns. Um, back down through the time, I guess, to, to what we know today as the bison bison. Um, what you, there are two different kind of bison. There's the woods bison, what you find find in the north in Canada, um, and then the plains bison, what we primarily are used to seeing here. Um, I'm gonna that. Okay. Um, the woods bison are going to be a little bigger, bigger framed, and they have a less defined hump. And the plains bison are more, are a little smaller framed. Uh, you, you, my experience, you kind of got to be pretty savvy at it to to really know that be able to pick out the difference. So just buffalo, we we prefer to call them buffalo. I mean, technically, uh, I'll tell you, I, I I learned depending on where you are in the world, you know, bison and buffalo are not the same thing. You know, we're we're comfortable calling them buffalo here, but I I went on a trip to Singapore on a on a kind of a um, I don't know what you want to call it a scouting mission I guess to see if there were some opportunities for export markets there and I found out like in Asia you don't want to call them buffalo because when you say buffalo over there they immediately think you're talking about water buffalo and they're definitely not the same and that's a very low grade meat to them over there and it. And then some cultures, I guess it's also kind of like a derogatory type word that they'll use. Like if somebody's being being dumb, they'll call them a buffalo. So I learned quickly that in, in different cultures, you you got to watch what you call them. But to us, they're buffalo. We're comfortable calling them that. We prefer to call them that here. So that's what I'm going to go with today. So for the Lakota people, the buffalo were our primary food source and they were basically our means of survival. Uh, our culture 
evolved around them and we we basically roamed the plains following these large herds that once occupied what we know today as the United States. And we also have the spiritual connection and I'm just gonna give a disclaimer because there's there's a lot of different versions of this, what we call our emergent story, but you know, from the beginning of time, the Lakota and the Buffalo have been connected. Um, our emergent story tells of how our people lived in the ground at Wind Cave while the creator was making the earth. Now, Wind Cave is in our sacred Black Hills, and it's a very, probably the most sacred place for the Lakota Sioux people. Well, while the creator was making the earth, some of the people disobeyed and they went to the surface. And the story goes that it was, uh, it was, uh, I want to think it was the coyote that took them to the surface. And when the creator found out they were there, he turned them into beasts to punish them. And this was the first herd of buffalo. So when he got done creating the earth and the creator told the Lakota it was time to go to the surface through the wind cave, the first things they, they saw when they emerged were these hoof prints in the snow. The, they said, you know, how, what are we going to do? We don't know how to survive in this world. And the creator told them to follow the buffalo and they'll provide you everything you need to survive on earth. And basically, that's how our people lived for as much as we know, thousands of years, you know. Um, every part of the buffalo was used, you know, from creating knives and tools and um use bladders to carry water um, just you know there was nothing that ever went to waste and they were our sense of life how we survived so originally we hunted in many different ways but one of them one of the methods we used was to chase them over a cliff into a deeper ravine or a hole and you might have heard of these areas before they they refer to them as buffalo jumps um, there's some famous ones um, like uh, right by the South Dakota and Wyoming border on Highway I-90. There's there's one, um, a few different spots, but you know they've dug down and there's thousands of years of of um, buffalo in these areas. There are two other things that made the Lakota much more efficient hunters over the years. And that first thing was the horse, which our history tells us that we first acquired in the early 1700s. You know, it gave us the ability to chase the buffalo down and we quickly became some very good horsemen. And the second thing was, of course, the rifle, which we first think we acquired in the mid 1800s. Um, it, it gave us a whole new way to to hunt hunt these animals. So as westward expansion became a thing, um, you know the buffalo really became a victim of this, and and what you all know as the Indian Wars. I think this is a painting that's supposed to somewhat depict the battle of Little Bighorn here. So the buffalo were hunted to near extinction. Um, extermination of the buffalo would starve the Plains Indians. President Ulysses S. Grant saw the destruction of the buffalo as a solution to the country's Indian problem. And General Sheridan also shared his view that the extermination of the buffalo and his victory over the Plains Indians as a single objective and he considered any buffalo hunt to be business of the army. Now, this is a historic picture. Um, you can see all these buffalo hides that they have piled up here. I'm not sure where that picture is taken. So thousands of buffalo runners like the famous Buffalo Bill Cole, Cody were enlisted to hunt the buffalo. Um, Bill Cody claimed to have killed 4,280 buffalo in an 18-month period. And it was also said that a good hunter was able to kill up to 50 head a day. 
And basically all they did was slice through their humps. They skinned them and cut out their tongue and they left the rest to rot on the prairie. And this is another famous picture of a stack of buffalo skulls. You know, Buffalo Bill Cody was said to his, was said to his, was quoted as saying, kill every buffalo you can, every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. And General Sherman stated as long as the Sioux could hunt buffalo, they would never surrender to life with a plow. And the kind of the, the ironic thing in all of this was in 1875, Congress actually passed a bill to protect the buffalo because there was a lot of concern that they were hunting them to this point of extinction. But uh, President Grant refused to sign it. The buffalo once numbered an estimate 30 million head, and by the end of the 19th century, only a few hundred remained in the wild. And here's another picture of buffalo skulls. Another quote that was taken from a railway worker to a reporter during this time was, it's a mercy they can't eat bones. We were never able to control the savages until their supply of meat was cut off. So the man who really saved the buffalo, most historians will credit a gentleman named Scotty Phillips in the, who's in the background on the right on that wagon was saving the buffalo. Uh, his, his efforts were very significant. A less known fact is where he got his buffalo. So Scotty Phillips is a very famous person in South Dakota. Um, the town of Phillip is actually named after him. Um, and like, you, like you'll, you'll hear it a lot, how he's credited with saving the buffalo. But what most people don't know is there was a gentleman named Fred Dupree who was married to a Cheyenne River citizen whose name was a good elk woman. And they made their home on the Cheyenne River. In 1883, Fred and his sons captured five buffalo calves on the Grand River. It's said to, it's thought that they were on the Grand River anyway. <clears throat> they then brought this herd home to Shine River and he grew that herd to about 74 head at the time of his death. After his death, they had an estate sale and Scotty Phillips purchased this herd and that, that's what Scotty Phillips used to grow his herd which was turned around and purchased by the, some were purchased, I should say, by the state of South Dakota. And those were used at Scotty Phillips estate sale. And that was the animals that they used to stop Custer State Park. And those buffalo from Custer State Park have been used all over the United States and the nation to, to reintroduce buffalo to where we know it today. So that's something that we take a lot of pride in here um, as Cheyenne River members and as a Buffalo program is that, you know, one of our, one of our own was played a very significant role in uh, saving these Buffalo from extinction. And uh, just another side note, uh, the Dupree family was huge and he was a big rancher here on Cheyenne River. You know, it was said that when, when his daughter got married, his, he gave them a dowry of 500 head of cows and a hundred head of horses. And that's how big operator he was. So it's kind of a cool story. So a little bit of modern history of the Buffalo on Cheyenne River. I, you know, back to Fred Dupree's, I'm sorry to jump back there once, but um, just kind of another side note is, you know, we were recently contacted by a movie producer and they're, they're actually looking at making a documentary on on Fred Dupree's and this role that he played in saving the Buffalo. So their fa the family's pretty excited about that. And, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of proud of it too. I hope, I hope they're able to get it done. But sorry for doing that. Um, I'll keep, I'll keep moving here. Uh, so this is some modern history. You know, this is one of our big herd bulls out of, out on pasture. Sorry, I just, just noticed the chat. Hey, Amos, do you want me to jump in on those or you want to read them to me as they come, if you think they're applicable? Um, 
Sure, we can we can hop in here. Yeah. Did they do did they do anything with the buffalo besides storing them, uh, or did they just keep them for conservation purposes? Um, it seems that a selling point back in the mid 1800s to save them would have been their strength, but I don't know if a buffalo can be used the same way as an oxen. So are we talking about um, Fred Dupree's family here, or I'm not sure who we're talking I think, about. I think just in general, uh, what was the motivation of of saving? Uh, oh, okay, the sure. Bison? Yeah, no, I I think they you know they saw what was happening and that they were disappearing and and they felt the need. It was a conservation effort, I believe. You know, they they felt the need to to try to do something to save them and. And the story goes, I mean, they like set out horseback and were gone for weeks. And uh, the story goes that they they found this little little herd of very wild buffalo at the time because they had been hunted so much. And they were able to capture these five calves and and bring them back. And I I, I mean, I always wondered like, how did they? Because where the on the Grand River they talk about capturing them is probably. I suppose as the crow flies from where Fred Dupree's place was is, I mean, it's all of 80 to a hundred miles. So, I mean, it, it, I, I just always wondered like, how did they get them back? And I mean, there's just a lot of questions, but that, that I guess we don't particularly know, but I believe it was a conservation effort. You know, it, they saw what was happening and, and felt the need to, to try to do something to, to maybe save them, I guess. Hope that answered the question. Um, I'll keep moving on here. Let's see here. Maybe. But let me advance my slide. Okay, here we go. So uh, this is our this is our modern herd. Just just a picture of a few of them out grazing. Um, the buffalo were reintroduced to the tribe in 1976 when we received animals from Wind Cave National Park. You know, our, our herd has been in varying degrees of numbers over the years. I mean, I guess we're coming on 50 years of having them back on the reservation, but you know, at the height, I would say we had around 3,500 head. Um, you can see most of our pastures, uh, we have like this, that, that's going to be about a six foot tall barbed wire fence. Um, honestly, it's a good bluff. If they really want through it, they get through it. So we, we spend a lot of time getting them back in. But, but uh, it's what we have and, and we we're able to make it work pretty good. And currently, like I said, uh, we're man our herd is managed by our Buffalo Corporation. With cows right now, which we're getting ready to wean, we have about 1,900 head of buffalo, and we run on about 21,000 acres near the small communities of, kind of in between, I guess, the communities of Swiftbird and Blackfoot here on the reservation. So just a little, I guess, history of the reservation to kind of put things in perspective, because, you know, again, we were nomadic. Um, and a series of events kind of led up to us being where we are today. So in 1851, there was a treaty where the first Sioux lands were established. It was called the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851. And um, if, you ever, if you're much of a history buff, you'll find that it was almost immediately broken in 1858 with the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. And as you can see, um, it was all of Western South Dakota, a good portion of Nebraska, Wyoming, even up into Montana and North Dakota. Pretty, pretty big chunk of land. Well, after the treaty was broken, they revisited everything in what is called the Treaty of, of 1868, which reduced the lands from the Treaty of 51, and it sought to make peace between the Sioux and the U.S. government. And once again, this treaty was almost immediately broken with the Black Hills Gold Rush and the Custer Expedition in 1874. 
So basically the Treaty of 68 reduced the Great Sioux Reservation to what is today Western South Dakota. <clears throat> so th this kind of, this all happened basically after the Battle of Little Bighorn, but the government started with this sell or star policy for the Sioux, which basically this followed Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn. And it's where the government cut off all our rations until the Sioux ceded the Black Hills, which finally ended up happening by the act of February 28th, 1877. You know, this is a highly controversial act. Um, most of the seven bands of the, of the Sioux will state that, you know, they never, they never ceded the Black Hills. Uh, it was illegally taken. Um, and I, I mean, you know, the rest of the history, there's billions of dollars of gold that were mined out of home state mines and um, many settlements and uh, a lot of things that have happened through the years due to this. But um, this is, like I said, this is like our holiest of holy lands, like the most sacred of lands is the Black Hills. So the Sioux people hold it in high regard and uh, in our minds, it was never, we never really ceded it. It was illegally taken. So the act of March 2nd, 1889 is what created what we know as the present day Shine River, Standing Rock, Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Yankton, Lower Brewer and Crow Creek. This is basically what created our modern day reservations. And uh, this, the act of March 2nd, 1889 also made way for South Dakota statehood on November 2nd, 1889. So our reservation today, just to kind of put it in perspective, it's about 2.8 million acres. In comparison, it's about the size of the state of Connecticut. And it's also one of the re most remote areas in the United States as we're 90 miles from the nearest Walmart. Um, believe it or not, that's that's some kind of a fact that most people are within 50 miles of a Walmart in the United States, and we're one of the few areas that exceeds that. Uh, our population of the reservation is around 10,000 residents. Eagle Butte's our largest city with about 3,500 people, and there's about 100,000 head of cattle that run on this reservation. So there's about uh, there's about ten cows to every person. You see on the map, uh, Eagle Butte is kind of the tribal headquarters, kind of the most centrally located located city. So just a little more history and of agriculture here on the reservation kind of continue to put things in perspective. So once the reservation was established, the first efforts by the US government were to make farmers out of the Sioux. Well, after a few years of failed crops, it was obvious these lands of the Shine River were not suitable for farming. <clears throat> I read some old reports that were like from the, from the Indian agent back to the secretary of, of the interior, what we call today, uh, and it was like, you know, our crop, we had a good corn crop this year and uh, grasshoppers wiped it out. And then the next year it was, we had a good corn or a good crop of wheat and a hailstorm came through and wiped it out. And this went on for, you know, four or five years. And then finally there was a, this big report that, you know, after much effort, we realized that, you know, these lands are not suitable for farming and we, suggest we abandon these efforts and turn our focus to raising cattle. So that's where they kind of made the determination that, okay, you know, these lands are far better suited for raising cattle. And the government actually purchased a, a herd of cattle for the Sioux and they, they really grew quickly and, and thrived. And, and during this time, you know, many of the Sioux established very large herds of cattle and horses on this reservation.
so another thing that that changed the the landscape of a reservation was the Dawes Act, or it's often called Indian Allotment Act, and it was really set out to assimilate Native Americans. So basically, what the what the Allotment Act was is when you turned eighteen, every enrolled tribal member received a trust patent to uh, some acreage of land. You now most people got one hundred sixty acres, and I think heads of household got like a full section. Um, and that's what started out. This started like around 1909 or 1910 was the first allotment on Cheyenne River. What the Dawes Act also did was it allowed the federal government to come in and deem reservation lands as what they called surplus to the needs of the Indians. So there was a Cheyenne River Act of 1908, which opened up our reservation to cash entry homestead. And because of this, nearly half of the reservation came out of trust. So basically what, what it was, was it was it was similar to the Homestead Act, except the, the individuals actually had to pay for the land. So you can see on this, this uh, poster, you know, the average price per acre in South Dakota, was about $16.53 an acre is what they were paying at that time. And that was in 1911, I want to say, yep, 1911. Another thing that happened in 1908 was the, the U.S. government held this big meeting at the, at the Indian agency with the tribal leaders and they convinced the tribe to lease out about two thirds of this reservation to these large cattle companies, such as the Matador, the Turkey Track, and later on another famous one was the Diamond A. But they leased like hundreds of thousands of acres of the reservation for, I think, three and a half cents an acre. And um, most of them were only here for a short amount of time, except for the Diamond A. But one thing that these big leases of, to these large com cattle companies did was it, it really squeezed out those Indian operators that had established some herds. Uh, they kind of just got absorbed by these big Texas herds and Southern herds. Um, if you ever get a chance, there's a book called Dakota Cowboy. It's by a gentleman named Ike Blassengame, and it really tells the story of these large cattle companies on the reservation, in particular the Matador. Um, some of those, like the the foreman of the Matador, or, or maybe he was the owner, but his name was Myrtle McKenzie, and the town of Myrtle, South Dakota is actually named after him. And uh, there's also another thing that cropped up was all these little towns on along the Missouri River. Like you'll see on that picture, it says Lebeau, South Dakota. It's underwater now, but at one time, Lebeau, South Dakota shipped more cattle by rail than any other place in the United States. So basically, they would all of Western South Dakota would trail cattle across across Western South Dakota, and they had they either barged the cattle across the Missouri, or they had like barge bridges set up. And there was a town called Everts, and there's a town of Lebeau, and those were the two main places where they loaded these cattle onto rail cars and shipped them to Chicago to the slaughterhouses. But uh, kind of a story about LeBeau, I think I have time to, I'm getting off track a little bit, but it's kind of a neat story. So, so Myrtle McKenzie's son, his name was Dode McKenzie and he was a kind of a brash type guy. And he was, he was supposed to have been the running the matador here on the reservation, but According to the stories you'll hear, he spent most of his time in Lebeau at either at the bar or at the, one of the gentlemen's establishments they had there. Um, very brash, like I said, it, there's stories of him sitting at the bar and mind you, this is in probably 1910, 1911, but there's stories of him sitting at the bar in Lebeau and lighting, lighting his cigars with $100 bills. So, I mean, very brash guy, but as the story goes, um, he got into an argument with the bartender in Lebeau and the bartender shot him and killed him. And at that time, the bartender 
fled. He jumped a rail car and he fled. And as as the story goes, they they finally caught the bartender, brought him back to trial, and he claimed self defense. And everyone else claimed he murdered him because he shot Dode McKenzie in the back. And anyways, he ended up getting off with a self defense charge. And uh, a couple months after all this happened, the town of LeBeau burned to the ground. And the story always goes that it was the Matador Cowboys that burned that town to the ground after that. And uh, they actually tried to rebuild the town. And they, they got a lot of it rebuilt and it burned to the ground again. And then it was at that point that they basically abandoned the town of LeBeau. So just to, I don't know, I think it's kind of a neat story, I guess. So another interesting fact, um, Indians became American citizens and gained the right to vote in 1924. So that was about four years after women got the right to vote. And, you know, I think the, the black people got the right to vote in the 1860s. So, so we were one of the last, if not the last, um, group of people to to earn the right to vote and the big change came with the howard e. wheeler act or the Re indian reorganization act of 1934 this this put an end to the dawes act and the government's efforts of forced assimilation so basically with the indian reorganization act the tribe adopted a constitution and it created what's now our current leasing system and it's still what we go by today. Our constitution was written in 1934. And this is a picture of the Secretary of Interior signing signing the IRA for one of the one of the tribes. So that kind of shifts us into our modern day agriculture. Um, today, the majority of our 1. million acres of trust land are stocked with about 50,000 head of tribal member owned cattle. And the more, majority of our tribal members operate cow calf operations, we you know with spring calving, fall weaning, and they typically sell them at local sale barns. Um, you know, we have a small few tribal members that are doing some backgrounding and, and an even smaller number are actually feeding cattle to finish. Most of our tribal members just they don't have feed bases, so it's real hard to them to get into those type of ventures. But but you know we're seeing more and more movement that direction, so that that's kind of encouraging, I think. Jamie, sorry to interrupt. We're kind of losing you on the uh, camera. Do you think you could tip it down a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have my <laughs> I don't have my camera up. So thank is that you. better? Yes, you're great. No, thank you. Alrighty, thanks, Amos. Uh, we have a few tribal members who who raise buffalo similar to us but uh, our tribal herd is the biggest biggest buffalo herd on the reservation and like i said before we're running about 1900 animals currently horses are another um, livestock production thing we have here on the reservation and they they're going to range from you know large registered herds to rodeo stock to you know guys that just have a few saddle horses but definitely a big part of our culture. And, you know, everybody seems to still have a horse or two. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit to talk about some food sovereignty efforts that we have going on and things that we're doing in that respect. <clears throat> like the, the first step that we took was when we purchased Westside Meats in February of 2021. You know, Westside is located in Mobridge, South Dakota, which is, it's kind of a border town, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, it's it's almost right across the river from the reservation. And, uh, you know, Westside was a family owned business since the early 80s before we purchased it. And this is a picture of our facility. Um, we do have like a retail storefront. And then in the back, we have a, a processing facility, a state inspected processing facility. So when we first purchased this plant and 
and I tell you, it was it was quite an experience just uh, just getting the plant bought. Like I said, we bought it in February of 2021, but we actually started negotiations with these guys in about July of 2019. They approached us about buying it, and we kind of went through negotiations and thought we were on track a few times, and then we got sidetracked, and then COVID hit, and it kind of set us back and uh, it was a long drawn out year and a half process, but I'm happy to say that we did finally get it all done. Uh, it was a little more complicated because we didn't just buy that processing plant. We also bought a small ranch that they had right on the outskirts of Moverage and a, they had like a, we call it a, a, a feed lot, but it, it's, you know, some big pens where we, they hold Buffalo and, um the home there's a couple homes we bought with the deal so it was a, it was kind of a a big purchase in that respect so i think that might have been part of the reason it drug out so long but but uh i don't know if i never have to do that again it'll be just fine with me because that was such a stressful process <laughs> but um back to my slides here you know it did the purchase began as a value added venture, you know, a way for us to add more value to our Buffalo. The Buffalo market has historically been like a very volatile, I mean, highs and lows. And the one thing that remains kind of, kind of consistent in the Buffalo world is the, the meat side of it, you know, what, what the value of the meat is. So we kind of thought it made more sense for us to try to get in a situation where we could do some value added stuff and be able to sell that meat. So it started off like that, and then COVID, the COVID pandemic hit, and it really shifted our focus to like, hey, you know, I mean, this makes a lot more sense in regards to food sovereignty and food security. You know, when people started <laughs> going to the store and not seeing any meat in the counter, and um, you know, people really realized how vulnerable I think we are and how reliant we are on this current system we have and you know people realize that you know that meat didn't come from a truck it actually came from an animal and or, or your vegetables or any of your food products you know <clears throat> so access to food and where where it came from seemed to have become important again and this is a picture from our plant just some some uh, halves of i think them are beef hanging on the rail so at Westside, we do both inspected and custom processing. Like I said, we're a state inspected facility. <clears throat> we process beef, buffalo, pork, elk, and boneless other wild game. We currently do one inspected slaughter day a week and two non-inspected custom slaughter days. So we do a lot of custom slaughter for area ranchers and uh, hunters and you know whoever else, I guess. Um, and then our inspected stuff. Uh, interesting thing with the Buffalo is we're able to use our state inspection to ship Buffalo anywhere in the United States. Um, the reason for that is that the USDA deems Buffalo as a non-amenable species and it, it's not really named in the Food and Slaughter Act of 1924, I believe it is, which set up the current day um, meat USDA Meat Inspection Service. So like the beef and stuff we slaughter under inspection has to stay in South Dakota. We can't cross state lines with it, but our Buffalo can go anywhere. And this is a picture of the, our, our Buffalo label that we use. You can see the bug on there that's inspected and passed by our plant number 127, South Dakota. And our Buffalo sales are all over the United States and we sell them under this label. We primarily do wholesale with some limited sales direct to consumers. Uh, we have a website that is kind of still in the development where we're we're doing some direct to consumer type type um, online sales, but we have, we're not into that too much right now. Um, just some notable clients um, at the top left there is Chef Piet de Spain. She was the winner of the Next Level Chef food contest on Fox. She's one of our clients. Um, 
Then you'll see a Wamni. It's a Native American restaurant in Minneapolis by a gentleman named Sean Sherman, the sous chef, they call him. He's a James Beard Award winner. Uh, on the bottom left is Tokabe. It's a Native American restaurant in Denver, Colorado. They have two locations and soon to be moving into the Denver International Airport. They're one of our clients. And then the bottom right is Wapapa's Kitchen. They're in Oakland, California. She's a Native American style restaurant. Um, and, and there's others, but these are kind of, I guess, kind of our, our keynote clients are or high high level clients. So with our food sovereignty efforts to bring local beef and buffalo to our tribal members, there's kind of three three focuses we have right now going. And the first was to bring bring our meat into our tribal grocery store. The second was farm to school, and the third was to open a new storefront. So Lakota for Thrifty Mart is a tribally owned grocery store with four locations on the reservation. But an interesting thing to know is that they're affiliated with AWG, which is a corp large corporate grocery wholesaler. Now this is a kind of a side picture of the grocery store in Eagle Butte. So we run into a lot of challenges when we start <clears throat> trying to get into a, the corporate type grocery chain stuff. And we're not really, they're not really a chain, but they're, they're an affiliate of this AWG. And it's kind of a David Goliath type type situation, I think. And that's that's where this picture comes in. But you know, one one challenging thing is price points. You know, they're they're large scale operation. Um, they keep their price points very low and it, it gets a little tough as a small producer or business to compete with that and to top that off as a corporate affiliate they also offer dividends back to their their members which LTM is Lakota Thrifty Mart is so at the end of the year LTM gets dividend check back based on the products they sell for this group and the other challenge is that you know they're a one-stop shop so they can do all their grocery order in one bit not have an to order from 10 different companies or, you know, like us just ordering certain products from us. So those, those were some of the major challenges that we ran into. But I'm happy to say that we were finally able to get some of our ground beef into their store. You know, we're working through a lot of details and, and mostly it's price point stuff. Um, the other thing we run into is a consistency or a product composition like 80 20 85 15 different blends of, of burger um, we don't we don't actually make those claims you know we sell it as lean ground beef or extra lean ground beef and you know our lean ground beef is probably a, like a 85 15 blend and our extra lean is going to be your 90 10 type stuff so we run into some pricing issues there um, but like I say, I think we're kind of we're kind of working our way through that. Um, the one thing that AWG absolutely can't compete with us on is quality, and I think this is pretty new. Um, these products have been in the been in that store for about a week and a half now, so you know I think it's going to get to the point where people actually get to try it, get to see the quality of the product. And, and uh, I think at the end of the day, that's really gonna speak volumes. The other thing we've really put a lot of effort into is our farm to school program. <clears throat> In 2020, we were awarded a USDA farm to school planning grant. And that grant was to bring local beef and buffalo into our five reservation schools on Cheyenne River. You know, basically we really had two driving factors and all this and number one it was there are no there was no buffalo being served in the school lunch programs and the other thing was the quality of the beef on our reservation is not available for the school lunches i mean it, it's so frustrating as a as a producer and a parent to you know have 
see semi load after semi load of some of the best beef in the world being shipped off this reservation only to have my kids eating chicken nuggets and some of the other crap they serve at these at the school lunches and so I mean that was it, it got to really be a driving force for us like you know we we can do this better we can do it different <clears throat> so in the planning during the planning grant to to institute a farm to school program there's that there's basically three plans that have to be developed one is the action plan like how are you going to put this into place how are you going to integrate this the next is the procurement plan you know how are the schools going to procure this local beef and then the education plan and we were able to develop all three of those plans during our grant period So some of the challenges, if you look at this picture, what what's the common denominator here? It, it's vegetables, right? That's one of the biggest misconceptions out there that farm to school is to bring vegetables and fruit into schools. That was a challenge for us when we came in and wanted to do a meat protein. Uh, it was almost, it had been done a few times, but it was a little bit of, you know, like we were speaking a different language. Another one of the challenges is just the the experts were unaware of or of the laws and or they have making assumptions. Like one assumption was, well, if it's going to be served at school, it has to be USDA inspected. That that's not true. That wasn't true at all. And uh, you know, we really had to we had to take it upon ourselves to educate the USDA food nutrition service folks. Like, hey, you know, read your laws. It, it does not say anywhere in there that it has to be USDA inspected product. So there was really some challenges in education and um, frustrating times there during the grant planning stages. And it actually created some good things that came out of it was you know we were able to partner with with South Dakota State University Extension Service and uh, South Dakota Department of Education and USDA and we were able to develop this document that is now available I, I put the link up there but it's frequently some frequently asked questions about serving bison and beef in USDA child nutrition programs in South Dakota now I don't know if this applies in Iowa but uh, I think in some in some regards i'm sure it does some of the stuff but uh this was really set out to like clear the air like you know this is the actual rules this is how you can actually do it um it, like i say it was it's it's a good document I'm, we're kind of proud of it and uh, we put a lot of work into making this happen another thing like with the education side we were able to work with the Shinega School to do a traditional field harvest at a cultural camp they had last summer. Now, this is their their field dress in the buffalo here. You can see a lot of the kids standing around. So they basically had most of the kids were like uh, seven to twelve or thirteen years old, and there's about fifty or sixty kids involved in this, and it was really amazing to me. Like a lot of these kids are are town kids, you know that. They've probably never seen anything like this, but so I, I kind of thought initially I thought they would probably be a little squeamish or standoffish, but I tell you what, man, the kids got right in there and we had uh, a cultural leader there and, you know, they did some traditional things like eat some raw liver and drink the blood and I, it was amazing that a lot of the kids actually did it. And it, it really a great experience. And it even traditionally to the point where, you know, traditionally the Sioux people, the women were the ones that did the butchering. And as you can see in this picture, it, it was the women that were were right in there kind of showing everybody how to do it. So really a great, great event and something we hope to be able to keep doing in the future. Another thing we were able to do was to introduce some of these foods to the schools. Um, 
all the schools received some samples of buffalo that they were able to <clears throat> turn around and sample out to the kids and also some local beef. And we even took it a step further with, with a, a donated beef to school program at one school. And, and these things are going on all over. I'm not sure about Iowa, but like South Dakota, Montana, and Nebraska, where the, the producers are, are donating the animal to the school. And then basically, the, like in our situation, the school just had to pay for the processing. <clears throat> so it made it the price point where it was very competitive, I guess, with what they could get commodity beef and stuff. And, you know, it's, so one of the common things we found of it is the kids just loved it. They loved the local beef and the buffalo. And even with the local beef, we did some, I, I just talked to the superintendent and I said, hey, let's, let's just do it blind. Let's just blind, blind sample it to them. So I think the first time they did hamburgers and, and they said that that was the first time in a long time that they had done hamburgers where they ran out because kids were wanting seconds and the kids, they just knew it. They, they knew that it was different. So the second time they did a blind sample, I think they made spaghetti with some of the local beef and it was the same thing. Like the superintendent said, he, <clears throat> he interviewed a couple of kids afterwards and like, What'd you think of dinner these? Oh, that was the best spaghetti we ever had here. I, I don't know what was different, but it was so good. So, I mean, it's it really speaks highly of, you know, what we have available and what we can do to bring that into our, our lunch programs. And, you know, here on the reservation, you know, we have two of the top 10 poorest counties in the United States. And there's a lot of our children that that, that is, by far the best meal that they get is the one they eat at school. So I think, you know, we have a duty to try to make sure that's the best meal they have, you know, very, very good. So just another reason for us to do what we're doing with the farm school. <clears throat> so in 2022, we were awarded an implementation grant and we're currently beginning the process of implement, fully implementing our farm to school program. Just some highlights of this grant that we have upcoming. <clears throat> One thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in a Native American chef to do some hands-on training with our kitchen st <clears throat> staff on buffalo meat preparation. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're currently coordinating with Chef Ben Jacobs from the Tokabi restaurant in Denver to do this training. And, and that's a picture of Ben, uh, he's really, really good with this kind of stuff. He's done a lot of work with the commodity foods program on, you know, developing recipes and using buffalo meat. Cause that's one of the things that we always get back. I mean, buffalo was removed from our culture for such a long time that we run into a lot of, a lot of people have never even tried it. They have no idea how to cook it. Um, they're intimidated by trying to cook it. And, you know, it's not really nothing to be intimidated by. <clears throat> Basically, anything that you can make with beef, you can make with buffalo. It's just there's some little intricacies. But our hope is that by bringing Ben in, he can actually standardize a few recipes so they can actually get the nutritional credits for it and stuff. So that's part of our, our goal in that. Uh, another thing, then we actually just completed this as we set. 16 native beef producers, it ended up being to uh, bringing the farm to school training that South Dakota State University held. And it was just basically a training to uh, kind of introduce them to how to sell to schools and what's entailed and all of that. And it was a, it was a good, good start. Um, another thing we're working on is putting together a farm to school gathering or training. We're, we want to focus on our three stakeholder groups. So we're trying to do one day of training for producers and one day of training for school kitchen staffs and, and then a day dedicated to school administrations and school boards. <clears throat> what we found and just from seeing other farm to school efforts that have been done is, you know, when the grant's running and the money's there, I mean, things are full tilt. But as soon as the grant ends and the money, it just seems to die off. And that's primarily with the Buffalo. But. So we're hoping 
if we can get that buy-in from our school boards and our school administrations that, you know, we can make this more of a long lasting effort. And, uh, you know, some of the Nebraska schools, I, I've met with a few of them and there there's school districts in Nebraska that the school board just said, you know, we don't care what it costs. You know, we, we want all the beef that's served in this school to be sourced locally and we want you to make it happen. So, so I know it can be done. So that's, that's, that's our, that's our push there. Uh, another thing looking ahead, we're looking at is a new storefront in Eagle Butte. We actually, about two months ago, we purchased, uh, it was an old auto parts store, but uh, we're going to renovate that into a, basically a storefront and we will be able to sell local beef and buffalo to our tribal members or any members of the reservation in the Eagle Butte area. Um, we'll still do the processing in, in Mobridge and we'll just uh, truck and transport our products into, into Eagle Butte to the storefront. You know, we're in this renovation now. We really want to, we want to be open by Memorial Day, but I think I'm being optimistic there, but I'm hoping this summer sometime we can get this thing open. Another thing we're working on is to build a feedlot, you know, just another cog in the chain, I guess, you know, to to secure this uh, food supply chain that we're trying to build. We're also working on another processing facility. <clears throat> facility. You know, we're really limited on what we can produce at, at our Mobridge facility. And we have a lot of opportunities on the horizon. Like, you know, there's more and more government contracts for Buffalo meat. Uh, there's more and more push to want to create <clears throat> like a, like a brand of beef for, for the cattle on the reservation here. So, uh, we're, we're in the planning stages as well on building another processing facility and kind of what we're looking at right now, not a huge facility, but much bigger than we are now, it's like about maybe a 200 head a week type facility. And I guess just to kind of wrap, wrap all this up and see, try to make it make sense, you know, it's really about trying to take control of our food supply chain you know, from our raw material to our manufacturing, packaging, and marketing retail, you know, every part of this chain that we can keep local is is just really strengthening that <clears throat> sovereignty, food sovereignty, and the security of it all. And that's that's really what we're trying to do with this effort. Another thing is just that, that reconnection for our people culturally to our Buffalo and spiritually. It was something that was, you know, out of our lives for many, many, many years. So there was just a lot of knowledge and um, connection that was lost there to the point, like I say, you know, I there's just a huge number of our tribal members that have never even tried it. They've never even ate it before. So it, it's really, um, it's it's something to bring that back to them and and if we can start with the kids i think that's a good place um some of them won't even try it that it's that far removed you know so thank you for listening um i'm open to questions i hope hope i covered everything kind of didn't get too think, far off bounds with my time i don't think did i no, you're great. Thank you very much, Jamie. Appreciate you speaking today. Yeah, we were gathering some questions from the, the chat. Um, so I'll start off uh, here. Uh, where are you? Uh, where are your top selling buffalo meat locations? So are, are you doing most of it to schools or uh, individuals on the res or most of it going to restaurants? <clears throat> like our top selling, I would say you know, actually our like local market for our buffalo meat is not super strong. Um, I, I don't know if it's a price point thing, you know, but our, our biggest wholesale markets right now are the restaurants. <clears throat> we have some other, some other like, um, oh, there's some, uh, there's a place in New Hampshire that buys from us that does online sales out there called the Healthy Buffalo. And then there's like some small meat market type places, uh, like there's one in West Virginia, one in Washington State. 
<clears throat> we've sold some to one in California that, uh, you know, they just resell our product. And um, like our Buffalo jerky is one of our big sellers. Uh, we have we have a client in Texas that buys Buffalo jerky, like by the pallet load. And we kind of have like a white label agreement with the, they just repackage our product. And, but they're buying like 14 to 1800 pounds of jerky, like every other month. So those are those are some of our biggest clients. Our our local market's just not real big. Um, hopefully we can change that. Sure. Okay. Uh, here's a question: When you do things with the students, uh, do you have them sign any waivers? We'd love to do more on farm events, like you've discussed here for education in the classroom, but worried about liability. Um. You know, just bringing the product in. No, we don't sign any waivers or anything. Uh, and when we work with like the culture camp, we the school handles all that part of it. You know, um, with the field harvest, there was the school had done some waivers and whatnot with the children there. But uh, you know, our role is basically just bringing the animal to them at that point, and then uh, you know we're following all the all the health and safety standards when we bring that meat into the school. So. You know, we're not we're not doing any waivers at that point either. Uh, could you walk us through the uh, processing of a of a buffalo? Is there a significant difference between uh, harvesting uh, beef versus buffalo? Not tremendously. <clears throat> to do it under inspection, so you have to have a you have to have a, a post mortem inspection. So we have to bring the animals in live. You know, we bring them in just the same way we do beef cattle. We have some real heavy duty shoots and uh, knock box, I guess is what they, the term for it is, where they actually kill the animal. Uh, it's just it's just a lot heavier duty stuff. Um, but at that point, there's there's not a significant difference in how we do the beef. Just that you know they're they're a lot wilder than beef, you know, they, they will tear things up. And so it, it just has to be a lot more uh, durable holding type facilities. But, and I, I think that's the reason a lot of places don't do them, you know, because, you know, the, the smaller animals aren't so bad, but you get a 2000 pound bull in there. I mean, he can do some serious damage if he wants to. So, so, but other than that, there's not, huge differences with the beef. Is there a generational difference in public reception to your work, would you say? That's a good question. Um, there's there's some different factions, I would call it, I guess. Um, some folks aren't as receptive to what we're doing. Um, you know, they think you know, the buffalo are a sacred animal and we shouldn't be eating them and we shouldn't be butchering them and selling them. I guess it's probably not so much eating them, but it's the <clears throat> the business side of it that some there's a small group of people that I think that don't necessarily agree with what we're doing. But, um, you know, I think it was there was a famous Sioux leader that said, when the Buffalo thrive, our people will thrive. And the Buffalo will provide us for all our needs. Um, you know, the way we look at it is over time, that has really changed, you know, our needs have changed. You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna eat with bone forks and knives anymore, but the Buffalo can still provide for us. Maybe it's economically at this point, maybe it's culturally. But we have to manage them. We don't have, we're not in a situation where we can just let them roam and multiply. So we have to have some kind of a management system. And that's basically what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we're so remote that the economic development opportunities here are very small. You know, we'll never have a Walmart. We'll never have, we don't have a casino. I guess that's another thing. We're not a gaming tribe. We're one of the few tribes in South Dakota that doesn't have gaming. So, you know, our, our agriculture is our source of economic development. 
And we're trying to utilize that to create some jobs, to create some opportunity for individuals. And um, there's always going to be, I think, some people that maybe don't agree necessarily with what we're doing. But I think for the most part, people appreciate what we're doing. Because at the same time, we are reconnecting people to the Buffalo. We're making that available to them. You know, we donate up to 30 animals a year between, you know, uh, given animals for ceremonial uses uh, or, or uh, if somebody dies and they want some buffalo meat, we'll donate some buffalo meat to them. You know, we're, we're making some those things available that weren't there before. And we're self-sufficient. The tribe doesn't, we're not funded by the tribe. You know, we're, we're a standalone entity. So it's, you know, this is all part of the model that we have that allows us to do these different things. So, you know, I guess we just, we just work through it with those folks as best we can. And, and uh, we're compassionate to what they say. And it's not that we necessarily disagree with everything they say, but, you know, we just have a little more modern way of looking at it, I think. Uh, are there what other efforts towards food sovereignty uh, are happening on the reservation outside of the just meat processing? There's a lot of talk right now about trying to do more community gardens and um, greenhouses, um, some things like that. Um, the problem we really run into here, you know, with community gardens is if for say you're going to use it for the school, you know, our growing season, our school seasons don't align very well. So that that creates some issues. So we really have to look at trying to set up <clears throat> systems that they can do year round grow. Um, another thing is there's a lot of movement, not so much here, but it's starting to come here. But like on the on the Pine Ridge and Rosebud, there's a lot of movement on these small pasture raised chicken operations or you know with the tractors and chicken tractors whatever they call them you know and <clears throat> there's some movement towards that so you know i think it's all building building opportunity local foods you know we, we support anything that's local foods you know if it's not even not in our wheelhouse you know our thought was with the farm to school program you know we, we're opening this up to other opportunities and if it's a community garden if it's a Somebody wants to start a year-round greenhouse and grow tomatoes or something, you know, uh, we're going to have the vehicle and the processes in place for them to be able to capture that opportunity. So there, there are some, there's some movement. There's nothing real big right now, but there is definitely some, some movement that direction. From beginning to end of raising, processing, selling, how many people uh, are involved in in the operation with the buffalo yes um so like our herd crew that manages our herd we have about three guys that are pretty much full-time there <clears throat> and then they're they're basically taking care of those animals till they're about two to three years old and that's when they that's kind of the prime age to to process and then at that point you know, we move them to a more of a controlled environment where we can control their diets. Um, and the main reason for that is just, you know, product consistency. We don't have to worry about them eating some wild onions or some crazy weed that's going to make the meat taste funny. So we, we put them in that environment for a while. And I, we have a guy that takes care of them there. And basically when they're ready to harvest, um, we have a couple guys load them on the trailer and they haul them to the plant, which is about a couple miles from that facility. And at the plant, we have a crew of, I think with our retail front, we're running about 17 employees at the plant right now. At the plant, how much of the, uh, or how percentage wise, the animals that you process, how much are uh, tribally owned and then how much are private uh, from outside of the tribe? <clears throat> well, most of the buffalo we do are tribally owned. We do we do some, the, there's some uh, 
other local ranchers or uh, I guess like <clears throat> hunt hunting operations that we'll process for. But I would say 95% of the buffalo that we process are tribally owned. On the beef side, it, it's probably the opposite. You know, we're not doing as many beef right now. I think last year we did about, <clears throat> about 60 head of tribally owned beef. And we probably did, oh boy, I don't know. We're doing about, we do about 20 head a week, all told. So between the beef and the buffalo. <clears throat> so I suppose we did a couple hundred head of custom beef or we do some custom inspected stuff for individuals too, like third party label and like if they want to take their product and sell it. Because like in South Dakota, that's how the, the law the law is, you know, you can you can process it without inspection if it's for your own use. So that's where if you guys have seen packaging, you'll see packages as big old not for sale on it. That usually means that it was in, it was processed well, not under inspection. <laughs> but if you intend to take that meat product and sell it, you have to have it under inspection in South Dakota. And I'm pretty sure that's pretty universal. So we have a few individuals that, you know, they'll they'll sell some of their own meat. So we they they develop their own label and we'll process for them. But, but that's that's kind of where it's at right now. We do buffalo one day a week. We do about eight head of buffalo a week, and then the other two days we're doing beef, generally or pork once in a while, but generally beef. And you know, do do about eight head a day is what we've been doing. There was a question from the chat about uh, other resources for folks who want to learn more about uh, all of this and specifically any local authors uh, on uh, Cheyenne River Reservation history. On the history, uh, there, there's a few. Um, I know there's a pictorial, a picture type book out there that documents a lot of history of Cheyenne River. And I think it's just called that, the history of Cheyenne River, or something like that. Um, that's a good resource. Um, that Dakota Cowboy book I told you about, um, definitely really it <clears throat> talks a lot about the reservation during that time, about the cattle company days, but it also gets into, you know, he talks about, you know, staying with Mrs. So-and-so's charger or whoever's place you know they would these cow camps would pop up there and they would there would usually be a, a native american family that lived there and then they would kind of pop a cow camp up by them and so yeah it's it's a pretty good book um i tell you off the top of my head i i just can't i'm i'm probably not scholarly enough to <laughs> be a good resource on that but um I, I know there are a few few out there. I think if you look, um, you can sure find some stuff. Sure. Well, uh, we'll give just a couple more minutes if anyone wants to pop any more questions in the chat here before we end. Jamie, is there anything else uh, off the top of your mind that you want to share? No, I just I appreciate the opportunity. Um, something I guess that's kind of near and dear to my heart, kind of. The agriculture industry here has been part of my life, my family's life for years, and just to have the opportunity to kind of scale it up a little bit and, you know, hopefully we're creating better opportunities for not only our people, but also for our producers, you know, create some new markets for them, create, create these other opportunities that exist out there, and, and at the same time, developing a system where where we can keep this beef local you know we did some we did some things with uh, some of that farm to school like from where that where that animal was born to where it was fed processed and back to the school that animal had traveled a total of 60 miles and that you know that's driving them if you drove it out that would be 60 miles so you're within a about a 30 mile radius that animal was spent its whole life. 
And it's really hard to say that. You know, you walk into Walmart and grab a steak off the shelf, you really have no idea where that thing came from. You know, for all you know, it could be Brazil or Australia. You know, it's probably most likely it's not good Iowa corn fed beef, you know. So um, I think we all know the value of that. And to make it something that matters again is important to us. So, yeah, just a little tidbit there, I guess. But I, I thought that was, I really thought that was neat. Um, just being able to map, you know, where that animal had been in its life to the point where it was fed to those kids. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. It was no, a pleasure uh, learning from you today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess if you if you guys want me to, I can sure I'll drop my email address here in the chat. I probably should have done that earlier, but if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to me for any reason, we're always glad to glad to help where we can. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to uh, everyone for joining us today. Hope to see you again next week.